Good evening. We are going to do the next installment in our very long series about the uh, straight path. Uh, we've got these three theories going on right now. I will not add another one to the mix. Don't worry. Uh, we will be finishing a couple of them soon. But we've covered these nine lessons so far in this series. Not sure that I'm going to fit more on that little list of uh, and make it readable, but we, we've covered a lot. And we've essentially, as we've gone through, kind of looked at different stories of Scripture uh, in the order that they happen in Scripture. And last time we talked about David and some of the, the troubles that David had whenever he refused to make decisions. And then tonight we're going to move into talking about Solomon and focusing more on the idea of having the end in mind as you make the decisions for today. Uh, hopefully by the end of tonight's lesson you'll know the value of that and why that's important and how we should go about doing that. This is a regular practice when it comes to businesses, particularly when you get into sales and that sort of thing. I remember this particular form that you probably cannot read uh, came whenever I was doing real estate. This was one of the first classes that I sat down as a salesman and went through. And essentially what it does is it says, what do you want to make in a year? Like give a date and an amount for how much you want to make. And then it uses some formulas that you can put in place that will tell you, okay, well, to get to that amount, you need to make this many sales. But to make that many sales, you need to have this many clients. But then to have that many clients, you need to have this many conversation. And then you break it down to, okay, well, I have this many days from now until my target date, and I know I need to have this many conversations, so this is how many conversations I need to have every day to get from where I'm at now, zero dollars, to where I want to be, which is many dollars. And so you had this formula, you had this, this end goal in mind, and if you keep that in mind, you can work your way backwards and see what steps do I need to take to get from where I am to where I want to be. That's a fairly regular practice. I know that you do that a lot in the corporate world also, where you have certain projects you want to do, and then you break the project down into smaller steps, what things need to be done on what timetable in order to get from where you are today to the end of the project where things are completed. That's just a regular practice. I don't know why we don't do the same thing spiritually. Why do we not keep our, our end goal in mind and let that help us make the decisions we need to make today to get from where we are to the end. And that's part of what you see in the life of Solomon. Really, his downfall is losing sight of the end goal. Solomon starts off wonderfully. We, we give him a frowny face on our, on our king charts, but he really was a fantastic King. Open up to 1 Kings, and you have his story beginning here, really. In 1 Kings, he is chosen as the next king of Israel. And in chapter 2, you've got David essentially giving his farewell address. Listen to these words that David gives. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, be a man. Keep your obligation to the Lord your God uh, to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have success in everything you do and wherever you turn and so that the Lord will fulfill his promise that he has made to me. If your sons guard their ways to walk faithfully before me with all of their heart and their soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Those are important and great words of, of encouragement, of motivation, that if you will remain faithful, this throne will be yours. It will be your son's. It will remain in our family forever. You just have to do the things God has asked you to do. If the end goal is to keep the throne in our family, here's what you do on a daily basis. You follow the Lord. You keep the commands. You do what he's asked you to do. And so you've got these great instructions. David follows it up with some fairly hard instruction. 
about very specific situations that he dealt with as a king and how Solomon was supposed to follow those things up. And follow, Solomon does everything his dad asked him to do. He, does, he follows all of the rules and does all the things that, that his father said he should do. You look over in chapter 3, in verse 28, you have this statement made. All this is after you have the story of Solomon uh, you know, suggesting to split the baby in half. Remember that story of the, the dispute between the mother? It says there in verse 28, All Israel heard about the judgment the king had given. And they stood in awe of the king because they saw that God's wisdom was in him to carry out justice. Isn't that a great statement? That the people trusted their king. The people respected him. Not even just because it was him, but because they saw in him the wisdom of God. They knew Solomon was somebody who could lead them down the path they were supposed to go. They knew Solomon was somebody who was going to bring to them the law of God, the teachings of God, the wisdom of God. They respected their king. Not only that, he's wealthy. He has every advantage that could be known to man. Look at me, chapter 4, verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom... Very great insight and understanding as vast as the sands on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east, greater than all of the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone, wiser than Ezraite. Uh, Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, and the sons of Mahal. His reputation extended to all the surrounding nations. Now I want to stop there. Have you heard of any of these other people? No. They just kind of washed away in history. You heard of Solomon? Yes. That's how much he exceeded his peers. That's how much greater his wisdom was. Keep reading. Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about trees from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop growing out of the wall. He spoke about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, emissaries of all people sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom came and listened to Solomon's wisdom. He had every advantage from making every right decision that ever needed to be made. He was, he was privileged with abundant wealth. He had a, a people behind him. He had a God behind him. He had the wisdom of God in him. He had every advantage you could possibly want, right? I mean, you look at this man's life and you go, wow, he is destined for success. He is absolutely going to far and away exceed all of his peers and all of his predecessors, and he's going to be better than anybody who comes after him. He has it made. His own father is known as the man after God's own heart. Solomon should have succeeded. And for a long time he does. You start flipping pages in your Bible. He's successful in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8, he has this beautiful dedication of the temple and great statements about the providence of God and God's faithfulness and what God will do for the people as long as they will follow God and do the things that God would want them to do. Chapter 9, the Lord blesses him because of his great uh, the, the, his great wisdom and the, the things he said about the Lord, chapter 10. He's honored by even the Queen of Sheba, another great ruler on earth. I mean, you just got promising story after story after story. Everything's good until chapter 11. Chapter 11, everything falls apart. King Solomon loved many foreign women, in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. Moabite, see, even, even nature doesn't like Solomon at this point in the story, right? Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, 
Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations about which the Lord had told Israel, you must not intermarry with them and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their God. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines and they turned his heart away. So many good chapters. So many positive things. So many advantages. So much wisdom. And he lets it all disappear because he took his eyes off of the end and put them on the women. And to put that in perspective, the very next verse says, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord, his God, as his father David had been. He lived a long life of faithfulness. And it wasn't until he was old that he decided I don't know what that number is. I don't know what birthday he just got through celebrating, but it was one with a lot of candles on the cake. He was old. And that's when he took his eyes off the end. That's when he let it all fall apart. Verse 5 and 6 says, Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. When he was an old man, he decided he wanted to pursue something else. And he let them turn him away from God. Verse 9 through 11 is the story of God's anger. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods, but Solomon did not do what the Lord commanded. Then the Lord said to Solomon, since you've done this and you did not keep my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will tear your kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. And we see in the next two verses that God says, I won't do it during your lifetime because of your father David but I will do it in your sons. It is a sad, horrible middle of the story. It it just, everything that could have been perfect is thrown away, is discarded because he wanted to take his eyes off of God and put it on the world. And brothers and sisters, we are always at risk of doing the same thing. It might not be women, it might be career. It might not be career, it might just be some pleasure of some sort, hobbies, uh, some, some uh, goal you want to pursue. I, I don't know what it is. It might be reputation in a community. It, it might be just following friends that, that you know aren't good for you, but you've justified to yourself that you can be good for them when you know that's not really what's happening. There's a lot of things this world puts in our path for the sole purpose of taking our eyes off the end. And when we do that, we run a a, a tragic risk. You've got to keep your eyes there. And here's where I think maybe, maybe there's a good end. It depends a lot on who you think actually wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Some people believe it is Solomon. Some people do not. I don't know, but I like to think it's Solomon because if it is, it tells us the story of repentance. If this book is written by Solomon, as some have supposed, what you've got is this end of life admission that he did not do what he was supposed to do and he should have done life differently the very end of first Kings chapter 11 it says this the rest of the events of solomon's reign along with his accomplishments and his wisdom are written in the book of solomon's events 
The length of Solomon's reign in Jerusalem totaled about 40 years. Solomon rested with his father, was buried in the city of his father, David. His son, Rehoboam, came king of his place. I, I like to think, I like to hope that maybe this book of Ecclesiastes is written somewhere near the end of that story. That Solomon decided as an older man that life, the, the way he had done it, might not have been the best choices. That's why you have Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, this, this description of old age. It's a beautiful description. It, it, all these figurative language type expressions of what it means to grow old. Uh, the sun and the light are darkened. The moon and the stars and the clouds return after the rain. On the day that the guardians of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, the women who grind grain cease because they are few, and the ones who watch through the window seem dim, see dimly. You know, that just sounds poetic, but if you kind of break it down, what it's saying is, and it's kind of funny when you start piecing it together, that what you have is uh, the, things just aren't as bright and vibrant as they used to be. Uh, that the, the you're no longer seeing the the sun and the, the the moon and the stars anymore because you're in bed early, right? Uh, that you've got the uh, um, the the guardians of the house tremble. This idea of, of getting trembling hands and trembling you know it just you start to shake a little more than you used to. Uh, the women who grind, grind grain, speaking of the teeth, you know the teeth aren't grinding food quite as well anymore. Why? Because they are few. I, I, most of them have fallen out by this point, you know. Uh, the the, the uh, windows are, are dim. The eyes are, are not seeing as well as they used to. It's a beautiful description of all the things that old people complain about. Like, that, 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 that's really what's going on here. And so you've got, maybe, Solomon describing, I, I'm near the end, and what I've found out now that I'm near the end and life just isn't, you know, my, my body's not what it used to be and I'm not able to keep up anymore, that, that all these things I pursued, they were fruitless pursuits. And you start looking how many times that's said in this book, chapters 1, verse 14 and 17, and chapter 2, verse 11, and verse 17, and 26, and chapter 4, verse 4, and chapter 4, verse 6. He says it's fruitless pursuits and that everything is futile and it's vanity of vanities and grasping after wind, after wind right? And now you've got this, this idea presented here of, you know what? All the pleasures of life, they add up to nothing, to nothing if you take your eyes off the end. Because that's what he says we really got to do. This famous passage from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12. But beyond these, my son, be warned. There is no end to the making of many books, and much study wearies the body. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God, keep his commands, because this is the whole of man. My version says, because this is all, or this is for all humanity. For God's will, God will bring every act into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. In the end, if this is written by Solomon, what we learn is his conclusion when all has been said and done, when he has experienced all the things he's experienced, when he has served God for many years and he had rejected God for many years, that when he kind of added it all up and looked at what all of life was about, the only thing that really had value in the end was serving God and building that relationship with him. That's what life is about. And when you lose sight of that, you lose sight of all the things that matter. You think back to that goal sheet that I put up there earlier that I had to do when I was a real estate agent. You know what? I never once actually completed a year's goal list. You know why? There were too many other things to think about. Too many other things to do. Too many other things that, I, uh, that I, I could work on. And so it was so easy to get distracted away from the end goal to pursue all these other things. And that's what we do as Christians when we take our eyes off the end. 
We get distracted by all the other things. And there is a great benefit if we would do the job of just learning from Solomon, keeping the eyes on the end. We're told repeatedly in the New Testament that we should learn from the men and women of old. That we need to learn lessons from their lives. Paul tells us that in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. And we need to be those who are willing to learn those lessons. Here's my question. If Solomon knew at the end what he knew, do you think that would have made a difference in the decisions he made until he got there? Because I think it would have. See, Solomon had wisdom. He had knowledge. He had an understanding. We're told that early on in his life, right? He's known for his wisdom. But that doesn't mean he believed the things he knew. He didn't believe them. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we can't fall guilty of the same trap of knowing the answers. We know what the Bible says. We know the Bible is trustworthy. We know we should do what the Bible says. Do we really believe it? Do we really put it into practice? Psalm 127. Turn with me over to Psalm 127. This is one of those unique psalms that we get from a different author. Have you ever noticed this? Psalm 127, a song of ascent of Solomon. This is one of Solomon's psalms. And he makes this statement. We'll read the whole thing, but I really want you to focus in on verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Some are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior, and sons born are the sons born to one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They are never to be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gates. And here's what I love about this, this psalm. Solomon writes it. Do you, does Solomon know anything about house building? Does he ever build a house? the best ones from history, right? He built God's house, the temple, the best temple that was ever built. And then he built his own palace. It took him 13 years to complete his palace because of how, how large and expansive and beautiful it was. Solomon knows about building houses. What's he say? Unless the Lord is behind it, it's fruitless work. There's a lesson there. Because the truth is, Solomon knows about building houses. We should know about building houses. Here's why. First Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Solomon builds the temple of God. Do you realize we're doing the same thing? That's our work. While we're not putting together stone on top of stone and hewing stone out of the mountainside quarry and carrying it into town and sticking it in place, we're building a, a different kind of house. Back in chapter 3, up in verse, uh, uh, verse 9, it says, For we are God's co-workers, you are God's field, God's building. Look down in verse 16. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for that God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. I believe this is talking about the church. But we are building the church. That's our job. 
That's what we're working on together. We are building the church together. Skip over to chapter 6. Chapter 6. And I want to read verse 19 and 20. Here, in the context of talking about sexual sin and the avoidance of sexual sin and why sexual sin is such a dangerous thing for us to find ourselves involved in, it says here in verse 19, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. We individually are God's temple. We are building a house. And if we don't build it God's way, we build it in vain. If we don't build our lives the way God says our lives should be built, we are living lives full of vanity, grasping for wind. If we think we're going to find some sort of satisfaction and some sort of approval or some sort of reputation or some sort of good in the pursuits of this world, no matter what they are, those things will not matter, they will not add up, they will not lead to anything good, and they are not going to bring you blessings. John says over in 1 John chapter 2, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possession is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. All those things that this world has to offer for us, all those things that the world is putting out there and saying, hey, come get me. Pulling us away from the end goal. Pulling us away from the, from the goal of being with God forever. All of those things are at best temporary. Temporary. I mean, it's, it's as foolish as this. If I were to say, hey, I'm going to give you $3 million dollars It's going to be yours for the rest of your life. But I've also got a $5 bill over here. And you're grabbing the $5 bill. Who would do that? That makes no sense. It's not even a, I'll give you $3 million if you wait 50 years for it, or I'll give you $5 now. That's not even, that's not the comparison. The comparison is, Three million now to enjoy for the rest of your life or five dollars now that you can enjoy for a moment. And we choose the five dollars, folks. We choose it all the time. When God says, I will give you abundant and amazing blessings that you can enjoy now and forever. Yet we still choose what the world puts in our path. Because for whatever reason, we're convinced that that's better. It's not. It's what Solomon teaches us. And Solomon says, if the Lord isn't building the house, then the house is built in vain. Brothers and sisters, we are the house being built. And, and with, at the risk of being redundant, I'm going to put up my favorite C.S. Lewis quote again. Because it is such a powerful image of the way we need to think about this. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting up extra floors there, uh, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. 
He intends to come and live in it himself. As us, folks, God wants to live in us if we will just build it his way. So I would encourage you, as you start thinking about the decisions you have to make and the decisions that are, that are on your plate, maybe right now that you're already struggling with, or, or maybe it's just you know, something that pops up this week, always think about it with the end goal in mind. Does this serve the end goal? If not, maybe it's not for you. But if it does, you can proceed with, with enthusiasm and confidence, knowing that it will help you get where God wants you to be. That, that can make all the difference in the way that you make decisions in this life. One of those decisions that you need to make that absolutely has the end goal in mind is if you've not been baptized into Christ and let him become your God and you become his child that's the decision you need to make. Because without making that decision, your end goal will not be reached. You cannot be a part of God's kingdom if you've never become part of God's kingdom. If you need to be baptized into Christ, tonight's a good night to do it. But for more of us, those of us who have already put on Christ in baptism, there might be something we've struggled with. There might be some difficulty we're facing. And if so, let us pray for you. Let us help you. Put, put some humility on. Know that your brethren love you. And we want to pray for you and help you if you'll just let us. If you need the invitation to get your life right, either through having your sins washed away in baptism, or maybe it's just needing the prayers of the saints, we want to help you. Come forward and let us know as we stand and sing this song.